This is the Master Brewers Podcast, brought to you by the Master Brewers Association of the Americas, a volunteer organization dedicated to continually improving the products and processes of our membership since 1887. Okay, okay. Let's go! 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 Master Brewers brings you interviews with the industry's best and brightest in brewing science, technology, and operations. Welcome to the Master Brewers Podcast. I'm your host, John Bryce, and today I'm joined by Steve Huffman of Mead, o- of Mead O'Brien to chat about boiler safety and brewing applications. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, John. Now, Steve, you're a longtime contributor to Master Brewers. You're the current president of District St. Louis. You are an instructor at the last Master Brewers two-week uh, course, uh, engineering and utilities course. Um, and an article you just wrote uh, was recently published in the Master Brewers Te- Technical Quarterly, Volume 53, Number 3. So first, uh, before we jump in, I'd just like to say thank you for dedicating so much of your time to Master Brewers. Well, I'll tell you what, it's a great organization, so I'm more than happy to do it. Good. All right. Well, now that we've talked about how great you are, let's talk about STEAM, okay? Okay. All right. Um, So, uh, your article starts off with uh, boiler selection. Um, A a small craft brewery can have some pretty dramatic load swings, as you know. So, you know, let's say five minutes ago you were boiling wort and heating water, but now you're only calling for STEAM uh, for, you know, a few seconds at a time every couple of minutes on your keg washer. Could you walk us through the best approach for a small craft brewery to use when they're trying to size a fire tube boiler for, for a new brewery? Well, you mentioned you already qualified it as a fire tube boiler. Um, and what that does is provide you all the capacity you probably need for, uh, you know, varying load swings. However, it's, it's uh, recovery time is going to be slow and um, it's not going to be very efficient in times of, uh, of non-use, you know, where you don't have much load. So the water tube approach, however, the combustion gases are outside of the tube and we're heating just the amount of uh, water that's in the tubes itself, you know, being fed. And right. so the response time is going to be much quicker. So a lot of new, I, I know uh, there's one manufacturer in particular that I'm thinking of that seems to be making a lot of headway and uh, it's not a commercial for them and I don't represent them. So, uh, but, but uh, in terms of having stackable uh, uh, water, uh, water tube boilers that, um, you know, have a quick response and uh, can actually dial up and dial down very quickly um, to uh, uh, really respond to heavy loads and then uh, uh, times of not much use, in which case then they're going to run much, much more efficiently. Do you, so, do you see that kind of um, becoming the, the new normal with some of the small breweries? Do you think that they're kind of moving away from fire tube boilers uh, for, for those reasons? I think so. Um, uh, my experience with uh, boiler selection isn't all that great compared to uh, the rest of the steam system, as you probably recall from the, the brewing engineering course. But uh, quite honestly, um, in the St. Louis area, we've seen uh, quite an influx of uh, this type of arrangement and the new craft breweries that are coming in around here. Okay, cool. Um, what about high pressure versus low pressure boilers? I see a lot of craft brewers trying to run low pressure boilers, you know, very near the maximum pressure so that the, uh, they have to do that so they can get an adequate boil in their brew kettle oftentimes. Do you have any advice for folks that find themselves in that situation where they're trying to operate a low pressure boiler, you know, at near its upper limits? Um not especially. I hadn't really considered that, but I, I really don't think that that's such a great idea to press a boiler to its limits. Um, to me, it makes more sense to, uh, particularly if, if the steam has to be distributed to a, uh, a considerable distance before you get to the process area, it might make sense to generate at that higher pressure and then reduce down. Yeah, uh, definitely. That, yeah. Okay. And that's really for, for piping, not only for the pressure loss that you're going to incur, but I mean, you can make a a smaller piping choice as well when you're uh, in that situation. Right, which helps offset the higher cost, you know, that you sometimes get with the higher pressure boiler, at least if you're not spending so much money on the installation cost too, right? Correct. 
Um, okay, now your article covers uh, the concepts of allowable accumulation, operating gap, and simmering in regards to safety valves, both on the boiler um, as well as at the point, points of uh, steam delivery. And I must admit, I've seen a lot of simmering in craft breweries over the years. Uh, I'm guessing because folks either aren't always aware of the required operating gaps or they're just you know pushing the limits on equipment that wasn't sized correctly in the first place. Could you take a minute to explain simmering and let our listeners know whether it's inefficient, dangerous, or both? Uh, I would say probably both. And uh, frankly, it just wears the, wears the valve out because uh, you end up with wire draw characteristics on the seating surfaces. But to explain it, um, I think a lot of folks think that, okay, just because I uh, select a, uh, a safety valve at the maximum allowable working pressure of the vessel, uh, we're not talking on the boiler now. We'll be talking on the, on the process equipment. Um, you know, ASME states that, that, that uh, your protection device has to be at MAWP. It can't be above. So people just think that you can operate close, very closely to that, uh, to that set pressure when there are norms that, uh, depending on the seat design of the valve, that uh, limit you probably to you know, somewhere around you know, 80 to 90%. So there's your pressure limiter right there. Yeah. And for those of you listening, uh, MAWP is maximum allowable working pressure, which Steve also defines in his, in his article in the TQ. Okay, uh, Steve, let's talk about the potential gap between uh, boiler installation and ongoing maintenance. Uh, is it possible to ruin a brand new boiler very quickly without proper chemical injection and monitoring and how can a brewer be sure they've selected the right company to provide those services in other words how do you vet a vendor for competence competency to be sure they're following today's best practices well that's a good one (laughs) i would say that um you know there are certain norms as far as uh analytical measurements that you're going to make for for, uh, your feed water and and uh condensate and so whether you're doing that yourself with the instrumentation that's uh, you know, commercially available now or your calibration service will, uh, will do that in terms of inspecting and, and, uh, and the like, uh, I can't tell you who's going to be good and who's going to be bad in terms of uh, you know, who's going to treat your feed water for you. But um, uh, I, th- I think there's probably people in industry in your, whatever, you know, your local area that could probably do so. so I would think recommendations there would be to uh, consult people that, that have had good experiences with a good house. Have you seen someone ruin a boiler, a brand new boiler fast like that without, you know, because they didn't put in the proper uh, treatment program out of the gate? I'm sure it's possible, but frankly, I've not seen that. So i uh, not heard of that. So, okay. I, I can't really answer that. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Steve, I sat in one of your uh, recent lectures uh, during the Master Brewers Engineering and Utilities course, which which is a fantastic course, by the way, uh, and I really enjoyed your lecture, and I was, I was glad to see, especially glad to see you call out a mistake um, that I have been noticing in almost every craft brewery I've visited recently. Um, could you please explain to listeners why steam drops, so going from your header to your equipment, should always go up before they go down? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the job of the steam distribution system is to deliver uh, dry, high-quality steam to its point of use, the heat exchanger, you know, the work boiler, whatever we're going to call the heat exchanger. And if uh, if the piping just drops out of the bottom of the piping, you're going to end up, uh, frankly, with a lot of carryover condensate that occurs. You say, well, that's a steam pipe. Why would there be condensate in it? But uh, even insulated steam pipe isn't going to be 100% efficient. So there will be some heat loss that occurs in uh, distribution piping, just trying to transport the steam from the boiler to its point of use. So good practice indicates that the takeoff is on top of the pipe. And uh, then the downcomer piping to the heat exchanger, uh, your job's not done. You really need to uh, drip trap that to ensure that the uh, condensate that's going to gather at that point, particularly ahead of any valve that might close, is going to be uh, dripped off as well. And yeah. again, that, that's to assure that you're going to have high quality uh, steam going to the heat exchanger. That's right. It's 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 amazing to me how often I, I see this not piped correctly. I don't know if it's just that there's a lot of pipe fitters out there that you know don't know this, or you know I'm not sure why it is. But um, do you have any recommendations for folks that are 
that are trying to uh, install a new plant so that they get this kind of stuff right? You know, is there is there is there kind of a, a go to to have someone look over your your steam uh, your steam pipe plan to make sure that stuff like this is is designed properly in the first place? Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, frankly, a, a company like ours is, has been involved in that for almost ninety years, and. Um, uh, I've so you, seen a lot you of probably have myself. a pretty good idea how to do it if if you've been doing it for ninety years, I'd say. <laughs> well, I'm not ninety years old. But <laughs> Your company, I yes. mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I know you're not ninety. Come on. <laughs> cool. Well, um, do you have anything else uh, you'd like to mention to listeners in terms of you know s- consideration for boilers or steam? I, I really thought your article was quite good. I hope everybody reads it. I think uh, anybody who doesn't kind of um, understand the basics of, of a steam system, it's, it's certainly uh, worth spending a few minutes reading the article. So thanks for, thanks for writing it. Um, but do you have anything else you'd like to, to mention to listeners before we hop off? Just that uh, steam systems in and of themselves are really a different animal, and it does take a unique uh, uh, expertise to be able to really do things right. And I realize that there may be educational opportunities that aren't taken or there's not that many that uh, uh, pipe fitters may think that uh, this is like a water system and it doesn't work that way. So there's a lot of education to uh, uh, tools out there. You know, some of the manufacturers have online, you know, uni- what they call university courses. And um, right. uh, in fact, I have a live steam lab in my office that that, uh, that we use for uh, uh, practitioners that uh, come in and we show actually how steam behaves, steam and condensate behaves under glass. It's glass piping. So, you know, there's a number of people that do this sort of thing. Uh, and and I think that I would advise anyone who doesn't have good knowledge of uh, steam systems to try and get some before you make a big investment. Good advice, Steve. Well, thanks a lot for joining us today, and thanks for everything you do for Master Brewers. And uh, those of you out there listening, if you want to get a little more education on steam and and lots of other utilities and systems that happen in the brewery, be sure to consider the Master Brewers two-week course because it's it's definitely a good one. Steve, have a great day. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. If you're installing a steam system in your brewery, you're crazy not to read Steve Huffman's article, Boiler Safety and Brewing Applications, in the Master Brewers Technical Quarterly, Volume 53, Number 3. Download it now at mbaa.com. Join us next week for episode 20 with Alex Gertzman as we discuss a traditional Russian beverage known as kvass. I actually grew up in uh, Russia. It was still Soviet Union. And um, the only way we would buy kvass commercially, if you know, if you see a, a yellow truck pull up, it's like a, you know, a barrel, a, a big barrel truck and everybody would run out with their vessels you know like a two liter jar or whatever and then you can also get a fresh mug uh, filled filled uh, and this was the only way to get um, commercially made cloth my fist full of courage my heart full of rage well, i can't get stuck i can't be losing too much and